Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Matthew Hastings today. So uh, he did his PhD in 1997 at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with Leonid Levitov. Uh, and then uh, he was at Princeton from 1997 to 2000, and then a researcher at Los Alamos National Lab. And since 2009, he is a principal researcher at Microsoft. And today, Matthew is going to tell us about gapped quantum systems from higher dimensional Lieb Schultz Mathis to the quantum Hall effect. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, a lot of work over the years on understanding local gapped quantum systems. Um, and some surprising idea that the best way to understand static properties of these systems is to look at dynamical properties as expressed by a, some bounds called Lieb Robinson bounds. But I really want to start at the beginning and try to make this as accessible to everyone and say first, what is uh, what is quantum mechanics? Hopefully this will even be accessible if you don't know uh, what is quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, the state of the world at any moment is described by some vector, which we conventionally write as psi in some Hilbert space. It's a vector in a complex Hilbert space. And it obeys an equation of motion. The equation of motion is a linear differential equation that d psi dt is written as h psi, where h is an operator called the Hamiltonian, and h is a self-adjoint operator. Now, for the purposes of this talk, for the purposes of this talk, um, h will be the 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 um, vector will be in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, a finite dimensional complex Hilbert space, and so h is simply a finite matrix. Um, and so if this were all there were to the story, it would be rather boring. All it would be would be low dimensional linear algebra, finite dimensional linear algebra. However, one of the most important ingredients is the idea of locality, locality of interactions, that the interactions have a certain um, uh, local nature. And so this is expressed um, by uh, the idea that the, the Hilbert space that Psi lives in has a tensor product structure. There's a set often called lambda of what we call sites. Each site has some low dimensional Hilbert space, perhaps two dimensions. And the whole Hilbert space is the tensor product of all these. So there's a finite number of sites. If there's n sites, maybe there's a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. These sites um, live in some space and they're endowed with some metric between them. So for example, you might think of them as living on a one dimensional line or two dimensions or three dimensions. And there's some distance um, that's a metric between these sites. And uh, given this, um, what we write is that we assume that the Hamiltonian is say a sum over sets X contained in this set of sites of terms H of X, where each of these terms H of X is supported on some set X. What does supported mean? It means it can be written as some tensor product of operators on those sites tensored with the identity on the remaining sites. So um, we then make assumptions that um, these interactions are local, which can be expressed by first each of these sets having some small, all right, diam for diameter, some small diameter. And here I'm gonna use computer science notation, some O of one diameter. Um, everything in this talk we imagine is finite. We imagine that there's a finite number of sites, a, a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Each site has some small dimension on it. The dimension on each site is O of one, but we will imagine a family of Hamiltonians of increasing size, a family of systems of increasing size with more system with more sites in them. But we'll imagine that the, the diameter of each of these sets is fixed at order one, and the strength of the, each of these interactions, which we'll write um, here expressed using the operator norm or the spectral norm, will also be fixed to something O of one. So um, we have this this case of local interactions. And when you add this requirement, this makes the problem much richer and. Um, you, uh, you, you can uh, lead to a lot of interesting results. So let me um, give an example of such a system, which may help uh, clarify the kind of setting that we consider. Suppose we have a set of sites I, which are labeled by um, integer. The integer labels the sites. And this is, let's say, periodic mod L for some even integer L. So, um, We'll assume so sites will be labeled by integers one, two, three, four, and so on. And um, um, I plus L is the same as uh, as uh, 
as uh, um, I. Um, and uh, on each site, we may have terms that we write as uh, we'll write x sub i, y sub i. Each site will have a two-dimensional Hilbert space, and each and each and we will make write matrices x sub i, y sub i, and z sub i. These will simply be matrices one zero zero. Oh, sorry, this these are called the Pauli matrices i minus i off diagonal and one minus one. These matrices anti-commute with each other and square to one. And we might consider a Hamiltonian such as. Um, This, I'm gonna write two different terms. Let me write the first one. So this is S of I dot S of I plus one. And this is a shorthand notation for X I times X I plus one, Y times Y plus one, Z I times Z I plus one. This is some interaction between neighboring sites and J one is some real scalar plus J two, some over I S I dot S I plus two. And we have another real scalar J two. Um, this is an example system. So the diameter of each of these terms in the interaction is only two. The distance between the sites is only two. And the, the strength of the interaction term is simply um, set by the norm of these uh, uh, J1 or, or J2, the absolute value of these J1 or J2. Um, now, this chain is a well-studied, this is called a spin chain. This is a well-studied problem and it exemplifies. It's a very simple problem. You can make an enormous amount of progress because it's in one dimension, but it exemplifies a lot of the properties that um, that we can talk about. So if you put J2 exactly one half J1, the problem is exactly solvable. And what you find is that there are two exactly degenerate ground states. I'm drawing little lines here to indicate what are the um, energy levels of the system. So um, more negative energy levels drawn further down the page. I'm sort of drawing one tick mark for each energy level. Energy level means simply eigenvalue of this matrix H called the Hamiltonian. Um, so you can simply exactly diagonalize H and this is what you find. And um, there is some gap, which I'll write as delta E, between the smallest level, the, the two lowest energy levels, and the first, the first uh, the level above them. And this gap is omega of one, meaning it stays open um, even as you take L, the size of the system, large, so long as you keep J1 and J2 fixed. This gap is omega of one. Um, this, the, um, now, if you slightly turn J1 and J2 away from this magic point one half, then these two low lying levels will split, but the splitting between them for some non-zero interval of J1 and J2 that you consider will stay as little O of one. There will be some little O of one splitting between them. Actually, it's always little O of one. Um, but what will also happen is this gap to the remaining states will also be remain omega of one, well, big omega of one. So we'll have some non-zero gap until you change J1 and J2 sufficiently. When you change them sufficiently, then that gap will go away. Um, so this gap is stable for a weak change in J1 and J2. And that's a, a non-trivial result. It's a non-trivial result because if you change, um, of course, there's standard sort of, if you have a matrix with some eigenvalues, you change the matrix a little bit, the eigenvalues change only a little bit. But if you change um, J1 by a small amount, the change in the norm of the Hamiltonian is actually proportional to the number of sites. So a small change in J1 leads to a large change in the norm of the, a large change in the Hamiltonian, H as measured in spectral norm but it actually leads to only a small change in this gap. And that's a, that's a non-trivial result. So um, this is kind of an example system that shows what we talk about when we mean a gap. We mean by a gap, we mean some nearby, some small number of grounds, quote, ground states, the low-lying states separated by little o of one, and then a gap to the remaining ones that's big omega of one. Um, it exhibits a number of other features too. Um, it has uh, a decay of correlations and we'll explain what that means. So physical observables in quantum mechanics are expressed by taking the ground state, or in this case, if there's more than one, more than one ground state, and writing, so I'll write sign off for the ground state. This is the most important one. And um, the conventional notation is something like this. This means um, take the state psi and um, evaluate psi uh, vector, then some matrix A, and then this uh, um, notation like this means the uh, adjoint of psi. Um, this is the expectation of some operator A um, in the ground state psi. And an important thing is the, like this, the, the average of the product minus the product of the averages. So average of sine on AB minus um, sine on uh, average of A times sine on average of B. Um, and one of the important properties of this system is that there is a correlation decay. If these two operators A, again, the locality structure is important, are 
nearby each other, there may be correlation between them. But as they get further and further apart, there is an exponential decay in this correlations. Um, the system has another property too. It has a conserved charge, um, meaning there's a local operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian. That's a sum of things on each site with integer eigenvalues. And it has a interesting property called the, uh, the obeys a one-dimensional liebschultz mattis theorem. And I'll get into some of those properties later when I talk about those, but let me talk first about correlation decay. And an interesting result, and this is one of the early results in this whole uh, field, is that um, this correlation decay can be understood. You, you can prove this correlation decay using simply the fact that the interactions are local and um, using that there is a gap. You don't need to know anything else about the system. And that will tell you that the correlations decay. And this is an important physical property to understand. And I'll sketch very briefly the proof of how this goes, because this is the first thing that illustrates how these dynamics interplay with the statics. And this is where I need to introduce the concept of the Lee Robinson bound. So I'll make a physical analogy. Um, in uh, special relativity, there is a light cone. So sometimes you may see a picture like this. So if you have position drawn in one axis and time drawn in another axis, there is a certain cone and a um, influence from some point can only propagate within the cone. It cannot propagate outside the cone. Um, this is a property of special relativity. Well, there is something similar here for these lattice um, quantum systems. Um, there's some similar property. And all you need are these ingredients that I've had here. I'll skip the proof of the Lee Robinson bound. Um, but if you have the ingredients that there's these local interactions um, and uh, bounded, the interactions have some bounded diameter, they have bounded strength, you need a few additional assumptions about the number of sites supported within given distance of any other site, which I'll skip over those assumptions. Um, but subject to those assumptions, you can prove a bound that's an approximate form of a light cone bound. So what I mean is we're going to write, and this will be needed a lot later. A of, if I write A of T, what I mean is we can think of this as taking an operator A and evolving it for some time T. And this is simply defined to be E to the I H T, A E to the minus I H T. Or we may say that the operator A obeys some differential equation, D A D T A of T is I H commute A. Um, this is uh, this is the um, what we mean when we say A of T. And if you take an operator A of X supported on some set X, I'll write a subscript X to emphasize that it's supported on some given set X, and you ask for its commutator with some other operator, B of Y supported on some other set Y, and we will time evolve A, but not time evolve B. Well, if X and Y are disjoint, then this commutator vanishes at time T equals zero. Um, but as the time T increases, the support of this operator A changes and the commutator may become non-vanishing. Um, well, what the Lieb-Robinson bound expresses is that there's some quantity VLR called the Lieb-Robinson velocity. So that if T is smaller than the lieb -Robin then the um, distance, right, distance between X and Y divided by this Lieb-Robinson velocity, then this commutator is small. So the smallness of T implies that the norm of this commutator AX of T with B of Y is, and I'm just gonna say is small. I'm not gonna say how small because there's a, there's a little term um, called a leakage term that uh, it's not exactly zero. There's not a strict light cone like in relativistic quantum mechanics, but, um, Essentially, for all practical purposes, you can imagine it's just a very negligible error. And then when you actually prove a theorem, you have to check just how big it is. But um, there's some negligible leakage outside the light cone. So I'm going to skip over just how big that leakage is. And um, just trust me that when, we, uh, uh, when I say things are small, that I'm saying the correct result. So now, how would we prove this correlation decay? This expresses the, um, uh, the first of these... Uh, um, uh, um, ways that the dynamic properties, this Lee robinson bound, these two ingredients, the Lee robinson bound and the spectral gap are the two ingredients that we need in order to prove the correlation decay. So how would we prove a decay of correlations between two operators, AX, BY? And now this is in the ground state, and I'm just going to skip writing um, ground state. I could write psi naught um, AX, B of Y, psi naught, but I'll just write A of X, B of Y. Um, A of X, B of Y, 
minus their minus their the product of the averages. Well, for simplicity, let's just assume that the average of a of x is zero and the average of b of y is zero. So we just um, um, we just want to ask uh, we can drop this product of the averages term. So we can simply drop this term that's the product of the averages and try to show that this average a of x b of y is small. Now, um, the key in order to, to show this, to show that this average is small when the distance between x and y gets large. The key to show this is to look at um, not just the correlation of these, but to actually look at this time evolved property. Take operator ax of t, take operator by, and look at their commutator. Their commutator means a of t b minus b a of t. And we can write this by expanding in a basis of eigenvalues. So some of n greater than zero. I'm going to assume for the purposes of this to simplify that there's a unique ground state. Um, we're gonna also skip the case of a degenerate ground state. So you can, so there'll be a unique ground state, which I'll write as sign on. Um, so this can be written as follows, sum over sign on, ax psi n, psi n, b of y, psi not times e to the minus e n t, e to the minus i e n t, minus sum over n greater than zero. So I'm just simply inserting a set of excited states, psi n in there, psi not, b of y, psi n, psi n, a of x, psi not, e to the plus i e n t. So, um, and we'll just normalize that E naught is equal to zero, just for, um, uh, I should write E of N minus E of naught, but just to save on income, right? I'm assuming E, e naught is equal to zero. Um, so this is, this is an exact expression. And so what we would like to do is we really want the first line of this expression. We want the, the line up, um, the, the, the first term in the sum up here. And uh, we would like to take that first term at T equals zero. If we take the first term in the sum, at t equals zero, then um, that's exactly what we want. We want to get rid of the second term. I want to take the first term in the sum at t equals zero. And you can think of this as being the negative frequency part of this. It's the it's the sum of the uh, negative Fourier coefficients of it. So a way to get the answer would be take this expectation a of x b of y Fourier transform it, multiply it by a step function that picks out the uh, um, uh, negative, well, a step function like this that picks out the negative frequency part, then Fourier transform it back. Now, disregarding uh, the worry that the step function is not a compactly supported and so it doesn't have a Fourier transform. Um, if you want to take a Fourier transform, multiply by a function, and then take back the Fourier transform, what you would want to do is just convolve with something. So we want to actually up to that detail, which is pretty easy to deal with. What we want to do is take this expectation a of x t b of y and convolve it with something as a function of t, and that will give us our desired answer. So let me draw, um, here's our step function. And the key idea though, is that while this step function has some discontinuity near zero, actually there is a gap, there's a spectral gap, and all of our um, energies are at least delta e. So what it would suffice is to get something that's actually very close to the step function for energies that are bigger than the gap, but not the same, not can be whatever it wants for energies smaller than the gap. So we can come up with some approximation to the step function, which works just as well as what we want because there's a spectral gap, but is much smoother. And so it's Fourier transform, dealing with the property that's not compactly supported, um, will be fast decaying in real time. So um, and then this will allow us to use the Lee Robinson bounds. So to put this into um, into action, um, what we what we have is in fact that um, uh, we can get an approximation to the, to this uh, by taking a family of uh, a family of functions. And what we have is you can prove some little lemma that expectation a of x b of y is the limit t goes to infinity limit as epsilon goes to zero, i over two pi, integral minus t to t. T 
times um, uh, uh, e to the minus alpha t squared, where alpha is a parameter we will um, choose later, plus an error term that's of x minus delta e squared over four alpha. So what have we written here? Well, this alpha is some parameter. If we had alpha equal to um, uh, uh, zero, then the second error, the error term on the second line would go away. And what we would have is something you can naively think of as a Fourier transform of the step function is one over t plus i epsilon. Um, looks a lot like pulling out the negative frequency part, but we've taken it and we've multiplied it by a Gaussian in time. And that is amounts to sort of smoothing out the step function. Um, that's the intuition behind this expression. Now, then all there is is a, is a matter of taking a choice of alpha. If we take alpha to be very small, the second error term is small. This is because we then have very well approximated the step function, um, but we don't have good control over the first line. On the other hand, if alpha is larger than this Gaussian in the first line, uh, cuts off terms in the integral when t gets large. And oh, sorry, I forgot to write this as ax of t. Then this is ax of t, not just a of x, but ax of t. Um, but then this commutator um, is small because you only worry about small t. And if x and y are far separated, you only need to worry about uh, small separation. You, you, the commutator between them is small because there's not enough time for this influence to get from. Uh, x to y, and this is expressed via the lead robinson bound. So at this point, it's a matter of a few triangle inequalities to complete the proof. You need to put in the error from the lead robinson bound to bound this expectation of the commutator. You then um, need to choose an optimal epsilon. And what you get is that the correlation decays um, with exponentially with something that's like the distance between x and y divided by um, uh, uh, times the gap delta e divided by twice the Lee Robinson bound. So that we get an exponential decay at that rate um, in, the, uh, in the commutator. So this is an expression of the um, uh, correlation decay. Now, um, more has been achieved using these ideas, but a lot of it uses the same basic idea that you have some expression, it has some singularity, but using, for example, the discontinuity and the step function, by using some properties of gap, you're able to smooth it out. And then you Fourier transform Form back to, re to uh, real time and you exploit the Lee Robinson bound. So, um, one of the results obtained along this line was the proof of the higher dimensional Beebe Schultz Mattis theorem. Um, and I'll mostly skip over that and mostly talk about the quantum Hall effect. But a key technical trick introduced in order to prove it was the idea of what's called quasi adiabatic continuation. And this is a way of understanding how the ground state changes if you have some parameter dependent Hamiltonian. So, let's say we have some Hamiltonian H of S where S is some real parameter um, that the Hamiltonian depends upon S. Let's assume Hamiltonian depends smoothly upon S. Um, so how does the ground state change when you change S? Again, let us assume that there is a unique ground state. So you can write exactly ds sine naught, the change in the ground state is sine naught, is equal to the sum over excited states, one over E naught minus E n, which is a difference in the energy, psi n, psi n, e s, h of s, psi naught, like that. So this is an exact expression. It's just perturbation theory, standard perturbation theory uh, from elementary quantum mechanics or just perturbation theory for from linear algebra. Um, and what you see is this function one over e naught minus e n. It's a function of the energies. It's one over the energy difference. So if you sketch it, it's you know something that looks like that. It's diverging um, near the origin. And the idea is, well, we have some gap, delta E, and we could replace the function by something that is one over x below it, but smoothly interpolates like that. So if we had some other function like this, we want the function to be anti-symmetric for reasons I'll mention, um, like this that looked like one over one over E, one over e, e n minus e naught for the difference being larger than delta e, but then had smooth behavior near the origin. This will give us the same um, expression for the change. And um, so what we may write is we may write ds of psi naught is i, and I'll write script ds, where script ds, psi naught, where script ds is an operator we'll define. This operator is defined to be the integral dt 
ds h of s evolved to time t times some function f of t. So what have I written here? I mean, take ds h of s, evolve it for time t, and multiply it by some function f of t, where what is this f of t? This f of t is this Fourier, is a Fourier transform of this smoothing out of the, um, of the um, one over en minus e naught function. And one may pick different choices of the smoothing out function. And depending upon what you do, sometimes it's useful um, to pick a something that is uh, going to be a very fast decaying S F that has some Gaussian envelope and you're able to, but you have a little bit of error, error tolerated so that it's not an exact expression, but rather simply an approximate equality. Sometimes it's worth making an exact expression. And in this exact expression, um, you uh, tolerate a slightly slower decay on F, but still a super polynomial decay on F. Um, so this allows you to express how the ground state changes. Um, and uh, this, uh, this, this um, change in the ground state can actually be thought of as the uh, evolution in, as, of the ground state under this operator DS, which itself is kind of like a Hamiltonian. It winds up being a Hermitian operator and expresses that the change in the ground state when you change some parameter is like its evolution under some other Hamiltonian. And that Hamiltonian itself is like a local, a local property. And um, with, with this, um, it was possible to prove uh, uh, one of the first results obtained with this kind of formalism, a higher dimensional Liebschultz Mattis theorem. This expressed that in kinds of systems where there's a, uh, um, this was this was first proven in one dimension by Liebschultz and Mattis who considered one dimensional systems with translational invariance and with some conserved charge um, and showed that under certain circumstances um, that there was always going to be either a degenerate ground state or a vanishingly small gap. And so it's possible to extend this to higher dimensions using this result and has some interesting connections to topological order number of other properties in when you get to the higher dimensional version. Um, but what I wanna speak about to conclude is the um, application of this to proving things about quantum Hall conductance quantization. So what is the quantum Hall uh, effect? Um, just to give a little bit of physics background, um, the Hall effect was discovered over a hundred years ago. And it was part of a question to understand what is the sign of charge, they didn't know about electrons at the time. What is the sign of charge carriers in a metal? If you see that there is a current moving one way, is it a negative charge moving that way or a positive charge moving the other way? Well, the idea is that they had a situation where they had a metal, I'll draw this little box, and they ran a current in one direction. Then they had a magnetic field going perpendicular. I'll draw a little X to indicate that the magnetic field is going into the plane. And um, then the charge carriers feel a force. The force is equal to their charge times their velocity crossed with the magnetic field. And so what will happen is if it's negatively charged carriers moving this way, they feel a certain force, but positively charged carriers moving the other way will feel the exact same force because there'll be a change in the sign of E and the change in the sign of their charge. So charge carriers will tend to accumulate near a certain side determined by the direction of the current and B. So I'll write little pluses and little minuses to indicate an excess of charge carriers on one side and deficiency at the other. And so by observing this, you can determine whether the charge was carried by positively charged objects or negatively charged objects. Now in electrons are negatively charged, but there are materials where the charge carriers are either sign. Um, so it can be electrons or holes. But a big surprise was to find out, and this was an experimental observation um, in the 20th century, that, well, you can define what is called a Hall conductance. You have you run a current and you produce a voltage difference between the top and bottom. So from a current and a voltage, you get a conductance by taking their ratio. But if you looked at this Hall conductance, when you got to large magnetic fields and low temperature, the Hall conductance was units of E squared over H, E being the fundamental electric charge of the electron, H being Planck's constant, was an integer multiple of it. It was an integer multiple of it to extremely high precision. Um, and this was rather remarkable because these were not, these were dirty samples. These were not perfect crystals. There was disorder within the sample. Um, and yet, despite that, despite this, there was um, this almost perfect quantization of the Hall conductance to something like six or seven figures of accuracy. Um, so behind this, you know, why this property was so insensitive to disorder um, is, well, it's it, behind this lies um, some topology. And uh, there was a, a beautiful argument due to Laughlin that was a physics argument for why it happened, but not a proof. 
Um, and then there was a result of, um, well, there were many different results on this. There's no way I can summarize all of them. For example, it's shown that within a model of non-interacting electrons, um, if you considered, if you ignored the electron interaction between each other, that this followed um, using uh, um, uh, key theoretic non-commutative geometry ideas. Um, but uh, um, for interacting electrons, the uh, there was a proof by Avron and Seiler of a very interesting related uh, property. And in order to explain this proof, um, I need to slightly change the setting. We're going to change it, the setting to be a two-dimensional torus. So the, so the physical setting, you should identify the right side of the figure with the left side and the top with the bottom so that this two-dimensional sample becomes a torus. Um, and they imagined introducing a, um, since it's a torus, you can imagine physically sort of a magnetic field penetrating inside or going around the sort of inside of the torus like that. And in this, this, this can be written as, um, this magnetic field can be written as a change in boundary conditions, a twist by either an angle theta when you join the left side to the right side, or when you join the top to the bottom, an angle phi for joining the top to the bottom. And this expresses, let's say, when an electron hops from one side to the other, it picks up a phase e to the i theta, hopping back picks up a phase e to the minus i theta. And they considered the family of Hamiltonians depending upon these, these twists, the family of Hamiltonians depending upon these twists. Um, when, uh, um, when considering the family of these Hamiltonians depending upon these twists, um, you uh, suppose we make the assumption that there is a unique ground state for all choices of the twist. Um, there's, that there's, this is an, an additional assumption. Then they defined another quantity, which we'll call the flux torus, which I'll just draw very similarly, but now theta and phi will rather be axes. So um, there'll be um, a theta axis and a phi axis. Um, we're expressing these angles. If there's a unique Hamiltonian, then um, what you have is you have a you have a bundle. You have a um, line bundle over this torus because uh, the ground state is only defined up to phase. So for every point in this flux torus, there is some uh, there is some ground state. And um, uh, um, what it is possible to show is that the quantum Hall conductance at a given angle, say theta equals phi equals zero, can be expressed in terms of a small loop, well, really an infinitesimal loop starting at that point in theta and phi. And you ask the curvature of, of, the, uh, of this going around the small loop, how much phase does the ground state acquire as it is evolved around the small loop? So what was observed then is that um, if you uh, average this over all choices of boundary angles, this is necessarily a uh, quantized invariant, a churn number. Um, it's necessary a topological invariant here. Um, this uh, the uh, Hall conductance in this case, and it may be some integer multiple uh, integer multiple of e squared over h. Um, however, this left open a question. You know, this was an average of the Hall conductance over all choices of boundary angles. Would it be possible to prove the same result without making any average using simply the assumption that at a given boundary angle, theta equals phi equals zero, the Hamiltonian was gapped with any ground state? And the answer is yes. And this was possible using this idea of quasi adiabatic continuation. And just in the last two minutes to very quickly sketch what happens is first you consider the evolution under this quasi adiabatic evolution operator for an infinitesimal loop near the origin. And you show it's the same as the evolution under the, it picks up the Hall conductance in the same way. Then you ask about evolutions near other loops where you sort of move out and up and then go around another loop somewhere else around the flux doors and then return back to where you started. And Using the locality properties of the quasi-adiabatic evolution, it's possible to show that in this case also, you get the same answer, that you get the same answer for anywhere in the torus as you do back at the origin, up to, again, some very small error. Um, and this is using the fact that the quasi-adiabatic evolution expresses the change in the ground state locally. Um, and it uses an additional idea of what we can call virtual fluxes that, well, in order to evolve over here, you have to make some fairly large change in the Hamiltonian, but you have a gauge freedom to choose the flux in different places. So you can insert the flux sort of far away from the flux that's um, actually doing the small loop evolution. Um, then you can combine all these evolutions in something analogous to Stokes theorem, put it all together and show that the average of all these around all these little loops and they're all the same is the same as an evolution around one big loop. 
And then it remains to show that quasi adiabatic evolution around this big loop leaves the ground state unchanged. And again, this uses an idea of, um, of locality, um, which, I, which I can't go into. But uh, basically, you're uh, able to use these ideas to take this, take this argument and then uh, make, a, make a proof that the uh, Hall conductance is quantized for all choices. So I'm going to conclude here, but just say that it's really kind of surprising that it's possible to make a lot of progress on understanding static properties of systems, properties of the ground state, using just the um, uh, properties of their dynamics as the main ingredient. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And uh, yeah, this was a very nice talk. Uh, sorry about the short in time. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, bye.